Tonight, heightening hostilities. Israel vows to respond to Iran's unprecedented attack. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. Deliberations over the time and scope of retaliation. Please take the win. And the urgent global push for de-escalation. The difficult search for an impartial jury in former U.S. President Donald Trump's historic hush money trial. You should apologize to these service members. Plus, a police chief's promise to repair trust and the clash at a dramatic press conference. Also, bracing for predicted tax hikes ahead of tomorrow's federal budget. And tackling addiction with art. Kind of look like you were actually inside your brain. The immersive dome bringing brain education to children in the north. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone, and great to be back with you. The world is watching Israel's next move tonight as tensions between the country and its arch enemy, Iran, escalate. Israel today vowing to respond after Iran launched hundreds of drones and missiles over the weekend. Iran says it's retaliation for Israel's deadly airstrike on Iran's embassy compound in Syria earlier this month. And that if Israel fires back, Iran will too. Western leaders scrambling to defuse the confrontation, but so far both sides are ignoring their calls. CTV's Adrian Gobriel reports from Turkey tonight on a dramatic and dangerous shadow conflict now in full view. An entire region on the precipice of full-scale war. Iran will face the consequences for its actions. That confirmation from the Israeli Defense Forces has left the Middle East to brace for what could come, as desperate attempts by the West to tame Benjamin Netanyahu have for months now yielded little results. We have been coordinating a diplomatic response to seek to prevent escalation. The U.S. making it clear they won't take part in any retaliation. Israel is being urged by its allies to take its successful defense of Iran's unprecedented offensive as a win, with calls for calm echoing from across the Atlantic. I have been clear to my counterpart in Israel, please take the win and make sure that we can work together to bring, big, bring back peace in the region. Over the weekend, roughly 170 attack drones, more than 120 ballistic missiles, and more than 30 cruise missiles were fired towards Israel from Iran, Iraq, Yemen, and Lebanon. This is no longer a proxy war. Saturday's bombardment marks Iran's first ever direct attack on Israel, a response to a deadly airstrike on an Iranian consulate building in Syria. Officials in Iran say they've concluded the retaliatory operation. So today, they fired a clear warning. If action is taken by Israel, our actions will be more serious, proclaimed this spokesperson for Iran's foreign ministry. Although the Middle East is thousands of miles away, it has a direct effect on our security and prosperity at home. What has been viewed as a possibility for months now seems ever more probable as world leaders and the global community face the realization of potential war in the Middle East, the likes of which we've never witnessed before. If Israel responds with force, the U.S., Canada and other allies risk being drawn even further into this escalating conflict. And one of the fears here tonight in this region is that so far, neither side have shown they have the ability to concede. And Omar, therein lies the danger. All right, Adrian, thank you. Let's bring in former Canadian diplomat Arif Lalani, who has held multiple positions in the Middle East for some analysis. Mr. Lalani, Israel is saying it will respond to Iran's unprecedented retaliatory strike. But again today, no specifics on the course of action or the timeline. What is the calculation that Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu needs to make here? I think Prime Minister Netanyahu needs to balance uh, preserving Israel's right to, to respond to this attack on its soil uh, versus focusing on the priority that Israelis have told the Prime Minister, which is to get hostages released from Gaza. So I think Iran's actions have given Israel uh, some diplomatic capital, which they had lost in the last few days. 
So the question for the Prime Minister is, can he maintain strategic focus and deploy uh, the diplomatic capital he has today towards the priority of Gaza and uh, choose a response to Iran at a different time? Now, despite the vow to respond, Israel's allies are urging restraint. How effective will Israel's biggest ally, the United States, be at achieving a de-escalation of tensions? I think that depends on the ability of the Biden administration to, to focus on two things at the same time. The first is to continue to pressure and facilitate uh, a ceasefire and a release of hostages. And the second is to broaden the strategic vision for the region so that Israel uh, is able to live in a broader uh, peace and stability within the region. Former Canadian diplomat Arif Alani in Ottawa for us tonight. Thank you so much. 21 pro-Palestinian protesters were arrested in Halifax today. They were taken into custody after blocking part of the roadway. Police say they're each facing a charge of obstructing a police officer, with some facing additional charges. Donald Trump made legal history in a Manhattan courtroom today as he took the defendant's seat for the start of his criminal trial. As CTV's Heather Wright reports, the biggest challenge so far finding impartial jurors in a city that has a deep allegiance to the Democrats. Trump is not above the law. Trump. Day one of Donald Trump's hush money trial got underway this morning in Manhattan. USA. A familiar USA. cast of characters greeted the former president outside the courthouse as history was made inside, with Trump the only former U.S. president to face a criminal trial. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Trump is charged with 34 counts of falsifying business records in relation to a $130,000 hush money payment his former attorney made to adult film star Stormy Daniels in the lead up to the 2016 election. This is the first of four criminal prosecutions against Trump to make it to trial. Much of the morning was spent dealing with inflammatory comments Trump made over the weekend about his former attorney, Michael Cohen. The prosecution has asked for Trump to be found in contempt of court for violating a gag order barring him from attacking witnesses. That motion will be heard next week. Trump was warned by the judge he could be jailed if he misbehaves, disrupts the proceedings or fails to appear in court throughout the trial, which could see the GOP's presumptive nominee testify in his own defense. This case is as much for the courtroom as it is for the court of public opinion. And Trump is in the middle of an election year and he will take the stand and he will talk to the American people and those undecided voters. Trump was described as appearing to fall asleep at one point while also smiling at potential jurors. Jury selection could last up to two weeks with each juror expected to fill out a questionnaire that includes their education, opinions of Trump and the media they consume. They're going to be focusing on, on people that, that do not have um, strong views, you know, too much to the right or too much to the left. They want more mainstream. More than half the jurors in today's first group were dismissed almost immediately after indicating they could not be impartial. This trial could last up to eight weeks, meaning Trump could be tethered to a courtroom making limited campaign appearances until early June. Omar. Heather Wright in Washington tonight. The FBI has opened a criminal investigation into the Baltimore bridge collapse that killed six people. Federal agents armed with search warrants boarded the 300-meter container ship involved in the crash. They will focus on the vessel, the actions of the crew, and whether there was a failure to report an earlier problem. Thunder Bay's police chief admitted today that last week's criminal charges against his predecessor have led to what he called an erosion of public trust. But as CTV's Kamil Karamali reports, what were supposed to be words of reassurance ended up igniting a clash. Thunder Bay's police chief promising change. That a chief of police needs to be honest and accountable. But instead calls. That's not true. You should apologize to these service members. For an apology to police members who allege they've been abused for years. For severely damaged individuals who brought these complaints forward to the chief, the board. More than two years ago, multiple police officers came forward with allegations of corruption and human rights complaints. The former chief, Sylvie Hoth, and police lawyer Holly Walborn were questioned by the police board and Ontario's police watchdog. 
The Ontario Provincial Police were also brought in to investigate the local police force. Now the ex-police chief is facing breach of trust and obstruction charges. Court documents allege the former police chief and the in-house lawyer both made false or misleading statements, making it three police members arrested in recent months. All of this comes as the police force has faced scrutiny for the sudden deaths of Indigenous people in the last decade. The Nishnabi Aski Nation saying the Thunder Bay public and especially Indigenous people now have even more reason not to trust the police. It's disappointing that there hasn't been more progress made. Here at the Fort William First Nation, there is hope that this is the beginning of a new road. The truth is now starting to come out. We owe it to those people who had the courage to come forward. The current police chief says they're cooperating with the OPP's ongoing investigation and hope to gain the public's trust back by modernizing the police force, while those police members charged say they look forward to defending themselves against these allegations. Omar. All right, Kamil, thank you. Police in Australia are investigating what they say is a terrorist attack captured on a live stream of a sermon at a church. CTV Sarah Plowman on the horror and the teen suspect now in custody. And a warning, some of the images you're about to see are disturbing. Face down and pinned down, churchgoers jumped from the pews to grab the attacker before police arrived. The bishop was live streaming his sermon when he was lunged at and stabbed. The attacker, police say, is 16 years old. After consideration of all the material, I declared that it was a terrorist incident. Police allege the teenager traveled to the church with a knife where he stabbed the bishop and the priest. We believe there are elements that are satisfied in terms of religious uh, motivated extremism. <laughs> Outside, an angry crowd formed, wanting revenge, throwing bricks and concrete. We've had police injured and taken to hospital overnight. Australians were already reeling. Two days earlier, a man brought a knife to a crowded Sydney mall, stabbing and killing shoppers before police gunned him down. Of the six people Joel Couchy killed, five were women. His father says his son had schizophrenia and was frustrated he couldn't find a girlfriend. He is a monster. To me, he was a very sick boy. Believe me, he was a very sick boy. Among the injured is a nine-month-old baby girl who's in hospital. Her mother died protecting her. She's moved from critical to serious. Uh, that is a big change and a significant improvement. While no one was critically injured during the attack of the church, police say that the priest, bishop and alleged attacker are undergoing surgery that the teenager's hand was severely injured and that he was known to police but was not on a terror watch list. Omar. Terrifying moments. All right, Sarah, thank you. The chief weapons handler on the set of the movie Rust has been sentenced to 18 months in prison, the maximum possible. But for you, Miss Hutchins would be alive, a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. In March, a jury convicted Hannah Gutierrez-Reed of involuntary manslaughter in the fatal onset shooting of Helena Hutchins. Actor Alec Baldwin had been practicing for a scene when the gun went off, discharging live rounds that killed the cinematographer. An alarming new snapshot tonight of a nationwide crisis. More than a quarter of all deaths in young people involved opioids in 2021. The overall number of opioid-related deaths, including all ages, doubled to more than 6,000 between 2019 and 2021, with the Prairie Provinces seeing the highest surge. The study notes the increase coincided with the pandemic when people were more isolated and had limited access to social supports. The Liberals have announced economic supports ahead of tomorrow's federal budget, and with more than $38 billion in new programs already outlined, the focus will now turn on how the government pays for it. As CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver reports, there are predictions of a tax hike. Across the country, Canadians are struggling with affordability, and Patricia LaRock feels that stress every month. I constantly have in the back of my head, like I'm, I'm one paycheck away from being homeless. A single mom of two, LaRock says her grocery and utility bills keep rising, and if her rent does too, she may have to move. What I can afford on my current rent, um, 
I believe when I was looking, it would, it's not even a one bedroom. Ottawa has announced more than 38 billion in housing and affordability measures, including 17 billion involving loans based programs and 8 billion in new defense spending. Though today she was focused on the pre budget tradition of purchasing new shoes, last week the finance minister said that new spending will not affect the deficit. We are committed to adhering to those guideposts. And that restricts Ottawa to a $40 billion deficit. The private sector economists say Ottawa won't likely be able to reach without cuts or tax hikes. A big part of it could also come, or some part of it could also come from uh, higher revenues, uh, increasing taxes uh, on corporations, things like uh, excess profit taxes, like they've used in other parts of the world, uh, or increasing uh, taxes on the wealthiest Canadians. To compensate for new spending, Ottawa has ruled out tax hikes for the middle class, but not for the wealthiest Canadians. I think there is zero appetite for increased taxes. A tax increase is bad in terms of you know, public opinion, but it's also bad economically at this point. The big budget numbers everyone will be looking for is the spending level and the deficit, Omar, specifically how it changes over the next few years. All right, Annie, thank you. And a reminder, Vashi and I will be here to break down the politics and the numbers in tomorrow's budget starting at 4 p.m. Eastern. You can watch live on CTV News Channel and ctvnews.ca. Coming up, turmoil at Tesla. The magnitude of the cuts is troubling. Why thousands of jobs are set to go at the car manufacturer. Plus, stepping inside the mind to battle an opioid crisis. Tesla has announced it will slash about 10% of its global workforce. Currently, the EV maker has more than 140,000 employees worldwide. The move comes as higher interest rates are slowing demand for electric vehicles and raising questions about whether Canada can meet its EV targets. Here's CTV's Quebec Bureau Chief Genevieve Beauchemin. To many Tesla drivers, their EV is still ahead of the curve. Eric Rondeau bought his first Tesla more than a decade ago. And even, let's say, the car itself evolves, keeps evolving by software update on a regular basis. So this is quite unique. But once seemingly unstoppable, Tesla is now slashing 14,000 jobs. Elon Musk reportedly writing to employees that there is nothing he hates more, but that it must be done. The EV maker has hit a series of roadblocks, facing increasing competition and declining sales. But Tesla's troubles also come as overall demand for battery-powered vehicles has slowed. The sector is, in fact, still growing, but the pace of growth is now more sluggish. This as Canada aims to have all cars sold in this country be electric by 2026. If we don't address the barriers to electrification, it will be hard to reach the targets. Among those barriers, the charging network. We live in a very large country and Canadians are exposed to cold weather. So because of that, we need government to build an even more comprehensive charging infrastructure network. Another barrier is the price gap. EVs are on average $14,000 more. And with some government incentives set to wind down, some are pushing for new bonuses for EVs and restrictions for gas cars. As for Tesla, Rondo is confident it's just a bump in the road. So they're still ahead and, and it will take time that, uh, let's say, they, they are totally displaced. And down the road, say analysts, competition will drive down prices, drive up demand. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Still ahead, savoring a golden moment. Canada's comeback at the Women's World Hockey Championship. Canada is relishing a thrilling golden triumph over their biggest adversary, the United States, reclaiming the women's world hockey title. With reaction to the victory, here's the newest member of our CTV national news team, Paul Hollingsworth. A high-energy gold medal celebration for Canada at the Women's World Hockey Championship. Head coach Troy Ryan called it a showcase of poise and resilience. It was a roller coaster ride for sure. For the coaches, the players, and the fans, the ending of this game was a hockey dream sequence, an overtime goal for a gold medal win. It was 
was a wild one. Probably the craziest game I've been a part of, so we're happy to bring back gold to Canada. Canada spent the past 12 months looking to rebound from last year's gold medal loss on home ice. It's not about the Americans, it's not about Finland or any of our opponents, and when we kind of dive a little deeper into ourselves internally, uh, we tend to get the best results. Canada has won this tournament three times in four years. The Americans have captured gold six times since 2013. This rivalry will continue to be even keeled. Over the last seven, eight years, it has been back and forth, back and forth. And now with the launch of Professional Women's Hockey League, I think it's only going to continue to intensify the rivalry. As these teams inch closer to another potential showdown at the 2026 Olympics. Paul Hollingsworth, CTV News, Halifax. After the break, battling a drug crisis. It talks about opioids and it talks about where they come from and what impact it has on your brain. And then it talks about what your behavior can happen when you're ingesting those types of substances. Going inside the brain to change minds. A mesmerizing teaching tool combating addiction is making its debut in Yukon. Struggling under the weight of the opioid crisis, the territory has opened up a new outside world to teenagers, now curious of its capabilities. Here's CTV's Heather Butts on the immersive experience inside the brain. Walking into a massive dome, students are stepping inside the brain. This changes my development. And the way you see what kind of look like? You were actually inside your brain, which was actually pretty cool. The immersive experience tells a story from creation through the development of the human brain, how it reacts to junk food, watching TikTok videos, toxic stress, and most importantly, to drugs. And so it talks about opioids and it talks about where they come from and what impact it has on your brain. And then it talks about what your behavior can happen when you're ingesting those types of substances. In a community hit hard by the toxic drug crisis, leaders are desperate to educate kids and save lives, with a program also focused on healing. These are heavy conversations, so let's bring you back up. And it talks about what happens when you go drumming, what happens when you're out on the land fishing. The Brain was a collaboration with more than a dozen community groups, medical experts and artists, bringing this technology to Whitehorse. You will remember that experience and the way it made you feel, and that's more important than anything. They aim to reach teenagers with relevant examples. It was actually pretty cool to know more about yourself and more about how your brain works. Welcome to these lands nested on the banks of Chuniquan, Yukon River. Designed and created for kids in the north, it touches on indigenous culture, traditional teachings and aspects of life here. As artists, we figure out a way to communicate some of the world's issues. And I think we've done a great job at providing these youth with an experience that resonates. They hope the brain will inspire teenagers and spark a conversation that will spread across the country. Heather Butts, CTV News, Toronto. And that's a snapshot of this Monday. For all of us at CTV National News, thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.